Shalom and welcome to Shmoo's Views, Torah Observant Judaism. We'd like to welcome you back to the second of our weekly Parsha uh, teachings. Uh, like I said in the last video, we're going to be catching up where, to where we actually are, which uh, is this coming Pesh, uh, Peshat, I mean, uh, this coming uh, Shabbat, we're in uh, Leviticus. But right now we're still in Genesis. Uh, we're on the second Parsha of Genesis. And if you want to read all the Parshas up to where we actually are in the weekly readings, you can go to our website, uh, which is called Schmoozviews Tour Observant Judaism dot com, and you can catch the link to that in the description below. Also, if you like uh, these videos, please uh, subscribe, uh, hit that like button, hit the notification bell, and uh, let others know that we're out here, and we would appreciate that very much. Last week, we briefly uh, introduced a man named Noah, or I should lay, just say, actually for us, it was a couple days ago, uh, introduced a man named Noah. Uh, he be, became the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, of the spiritual darkness and depravity that had really just infested the entire planet. And to the point where God had said last week, uh, I mean, last time we were here, that uh, the thoughts and activity of every human being on the planet, except for Noah and his family, was on evil constantly. So <clears throat> today we're going to be looking at this man who was the last remaining son of light in the ancestral line of Seth, who was the third son born to Adam and Chava. We're told by Hashem that Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his age. Noah walked with God, Genesis 6, 9. Notice it doesn't say that Noah was sinless, that he, that would be impossible. For let's be honest, compared to Hashem, we're all sinful. No, he was not sinless, but he was blameless, perfect in the eyes of Hashem. Why? Because compared to the corruption of his generation, Noah was perfect due to the fact that he was always uh, abiding in the path of God. He was law abiding, whereas the rest of humanity was filled with lawlessness. What laws of God were they guilty of violating? After all, the Torah had not yet been given at this point. So, in fact, it was generations away before it would happen under Moshe, the leadership of Moshe. So exactly what were those laws that these people were violating? Well, in the pre-Deluge era, from Adam to Noah and afterward, the peoples were governed by basically seven laws of Hashem that have become known uh, as the Noahide laws. They were, do not worship idols or profane the oneness of God, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not perform acts of sexual immorality, do not steal, do not eat the flesh of a living animal, and do establish courts of justice. Noah and his family did their utmost to abide by these laws of Hashem passed down to them from their ancestor Seth. When they transgressed, they repented and made sacrifice, as learned from Adam and Abel, thereby making them in their generation righteous in the sight of Adonai and worthy of his special attention and deliverance for the sake of the future of humanity on earth. God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with lawlessness because of them. I am about to destroy them with the earth. Genesis 6, 13. Hashem then proceeds to lay out his plan with Noah for the building of the ark of safety for him and his family and the animals that are destined to be saved from the massive destructive forces that will be unleashed upon this planet and its inhabitants within the next 120 years. Why did it take 120 years to complete the ark and gather the animals? I mean, after all, Hashem could have created the ark instantly from nothing, or he could have, have simply beamed in all the animals and the food requirements with the snap of his proverbial finger. Why didn't he? One word, mercy. Hashem is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and return to him. He gave humankind 120 years to repent. Ask Noah questions about what he was building and why. 120 years to turn from lawlessness to obedience. 120 years to turn their lives around and return to Hashem and a life of living his seven commandments. Just as Hashem listened to the bargaining of Abraham to be discussed in later Parshas. 
oversaving the inhabitants of the cities of Saddam and Gomorrah, for the sake of as little as ten righteous souls, so too Hashem has, none, has Noah take a hundred and twenty years to build the ark to give the people plenty of time to come to their senses, turn from their wicked lawless behavior, and return to Him. Sadly, no amount of time would have been enough to turn their lives back to Hashem. So, after 120 years of loving and merciful patience, Adonai says to Noah, Go into the ark with all of your household, for you alone have I found righteous before me in this generation. Genesis 7.1 And on Shabbat day, very important, on Shabbat day the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Genesis 7.10 the earth was given, finally, it, give, it was given its day of rest from all the wickedness and lawlessness of humanity, who Hashem had granted sovereignty over it, but they abused that sovereignty with evil. All the foundations of the great uh, deep burst apart from the floodgates of the sky, and the skies broke open. The rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. If anyone saw the film 2012, and the wholesale destruction that that occurred over the planet in that movie. Well, what was seen in that movie was child's play compared to what happened during the devastation of Noah's period. Not only did it rain horrendously for 40 days and nights nonstop with blinding downpours, but the tectonic plates of the earth literally tore themselves apart with such force, causing the oceans to actually flip over, making miles high tsunamis the depths opening up huge fissures, releasing billions of tons of trapped water, lava, and gases. It was something that, will never, that had never happened before. And thanks to the promise of Hashem, will never happen again on a worldwide scale. Take a look at Genesis 9, chapter, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Genesis chapter 7, verse 23 says that all existence on the earth was blotted out. Man, cattle, creeping things and the birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. Noah and the ark floated on the waters for about 150 days after the destruction subsided. Eventually the waters diminished and found their way back to new boundaries, those that uh, exist to this current day. The ark after a time came to rest in what is known as Mount Ararat in modern day Turkey. They disembarked offered sacrifices to Hashem on the altar constructed by Noah, settled down to a meal of meat for the first time since vegetation was yet to be seen. Until this time, most of the sons of light were what we would call vegetarians. Now, Hashem allows them to eat meat, but with the same restriction found in the Noahide laws of not tearing and eating meat from an animal that is still alive. Noah and his family uh, begin farming anew, planting crops and vineyards. At some point, Noah takes from his vineyard, ferments and, make, ferments and makes wine, gets drunk and passes out in his tent, exposing his nakedness in his drunken stupor. One of his sons, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and ran out and told his two brothers outside. There had been a lot of speculation over the centuries about what occurred here. Suffice it to say that it is obvious from the Hebrew text and study, uh, and a study of the culture of that period, that Hashem showed no respect at all for his father by not covering up Noah's exposed body parts and immediately just running out and telling his brothers about it in jest. Shem and Japheth did the respectful thing, and immediately upon hearing Ham joking about it, covered their father's nakedness with a blanket without looking at his genitals or making humorless comments about the incident. If it was Ham that showed such disrespect, why was it his son Canaan, who may not have even been born yet, that Noah cursed? While the Torah says he was cursed, the use of Hashem's name, yod heh vav -Heh, shows that it isn't a curse in the traditional sense of the word, but a prophecy of the future descendants of Canaan, a peoples who would become the bane of Israel's existence until they are finally wiped out by the descendants of Shem the children of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the house of Israel. The remainder of Parshat Noah tells the rise of the human kind post-Deluge and the rebuilding of a civilization approximately 12 to 14,000 years ago, 
beginning in the slopes and hill country of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and eventually migrating to the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia, where a new rise in city-state systems of civilization began about 8,000 years ago, culminating in the first post-Deluge empire called Shinar, or Sumeria. This empire was ruled by a mighty king and hunter named Nimrod, also known in Sumerian text as Gilgamesh. It was at this time, several thousand years after Noah left the ark, that the ugly head of darkness began to rear up again. From the land of Mizraim, or Egypt, to Shinar, Sumeria, when the rule of men once again began to rebel against the law of the one true God. This was highlighted perfectly by the example of building of a tower that would reach to the stars in order to have humanity be like God and reside on the throne of Hashem, so they thought. Now known by all as the Tower of Babel, it was here that Hashem, in some way, caused the people to disperse from their centralized habitation and began spreading across the globe. Eventually, these descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth would create new dialects and languages throughout the planet. As described in the Torah, these sons of Noah and their offspring began to inhabit different areas of the earth after the Tower fiasco, creating their own civilizations, languages, customs, rituals, and traditions. Beginning in chapter 11 of Genesis, Hashem narrows the focus of his story to just one of Noah's sons, Shem, who would be the progenitor of a long list of descendants that would culminate with a man named Avram, who lived in the kingdom Shinar, Sumer, in the city of Ur, a prominent center of both religious and economic stature of the empire of that age. Next week, the Parsha, or next, next time, for us anyway, next time the Parsha and all future Parsha will deal almost exclusively with his people that will eventually spring from his loins, a people destined to be guided and led by Hashem to literally change the world and all of creation. Until then, Shalom.